All right. Good evening. Welcome. Up close. Meet the poet behind the verse. I am your host, River Maria Erke. And here to help me pull this off is Julie Martin. Say hi, girl. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, up here at Up Close, we like to showcase one poet a month with an interview, a give reading, and a giveaway. Um, it is our goal to introduce the poet behind the verse. Before we start, I need to remind the Zoom audience to please remain muted during the duration of the show. And um, and <laughs> and that we are and to give a shout out to our sponsors, League of Minnesota Poets. How's that starting again? Oh no. You guys hear that? Is that just me? No, we don't hear anything. It's really just you. Know. Okay. What, what are you hearing? Music. Oh, wow. Oh. I am. Nope, I'm hearing double me. That was annoying. Oh. The whole video started up again. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that was really frustrating. So everybody sit back. I'd like to introduce to you our September Up Close Poet, Thomas R. Smith. Now, before I knew Thomas, the poet, I knew of him and his wife. Actually, I didn't know them. Now, I hope this doesn't sound make me sound a little like a stalker, but I watched them from afar. See, they go on long walks around town, I believe every day when they can. And they are an unforgettable couple, Thomas with his beret and Crystal with her hats. The hopeless romantic in me says, saw the love I have always waited for. Then I met them and I wasn't disappointed because they are all the love I ever imagined. Actually, the two of them are the most kind, peaceful, generous people you will ever meet. Thomas R. Smith is a poet, te writer, teacher, storyteller, and educator. He dabbles in singing and stands tall against injustice and environmental protection. Thomas spent the first 18 years of his life in Cornell, Wisconsin on the Chippewa River, a small town with not much culture, but what they had was nature. His summer playground was a nearby state park. After high school, he moved to River Falls, Wisconsin to go to college. It was 1967 and he was an English major. He left school about 1970. So the next nine years, just kind of living in seasonal work, always coming back to River Falls. At 29, he went to Europe, experience that changed him and put him on his path for today. After a year, he came back home to River Falls. It was 1980 and he was 30. The same year he met Krista in River Falls, and they have been together ever since. They moved to the Twin Cities from 81 to 96. Thomas began working for Robert Bly about 1990. His first book at 40 came out in 1988, Keeping the Star. In the next 34 years, Thomas published 10 more books, poetry collections, seven chat books, and he's the editor of four books. A few titles are Waking Before Dawn, Storm Island, The Dark Indigo Current, and Poetry on the Side of Nature, writing the nature poem. In addition, Thomas's poems and essays have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies over the years. On Thomas's blog, <clears throat> possibly, You'll find fa fascinating essays written by him. ThomasSmithPoet.com is his blog. ThomasRSmithPoet.com. Mm -hmm. In addition to being a writer, poet, Thomas is a teacher. He teaches at the Literary Loft in Minneapolis, 
One of my favorite quotes I found from Robert Bly about Thomas is, Thomas R. Smith is a high-spirited poetry horse riding over the hills of emotion. So now, let us welcome Thomas R. Smith. Good, good day, good evening, Thomas. Hey, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, River. It was very lovely. Oh, you're welcome. I'm not, I'm not sure it's true, but I liked it. <laughs> ah, it was true, whatever. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, the first one I have for you is poetry wasn't your first form of writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the age of 13, you were inspired to be a fiction writer, actually. You told me after school you'd go straight home, lock yourself in your bedroom, and you'd bang out short stories as a typewriter. All this time you found you found your first teachers. This is at age 13 and 14, I think, right? Yeah. Can you tell us their story and who they were? Uh, well, this will seem really <clears throat> unlikely for where I've ended up, <clears throat> but uh, I was a huge... Uh, science fiction and horror fan uh, when I was a teen, uh, or when actually when I was a preteen, as soon as I could actually start to read anything that was quasi adult reading level, it was toward fantastic fiction. And um, I was lucky enough to get serious replies from two established uh, fantasy and, and horror writers that I wrote fan letters to when I was you know, right around 13. Uh, one of them was August Derleth. Uh, people outside of Wisconsin generally don't know who he was. Um, anybody, heard, anybody heard of him here? August Derleth? Any hands? Oh, see. Oh, okay, I see one. Jer. Okay. Well, he, when I was, when I was in, uh, in high school in Cornell, Wisconsin, my, my teachers would talk about August Derleth as being one of Wisconsin's uh, literary lions. And in fact, um, he was a prodigy of productivity and he wrote um, in many genres. Uh, he could write 10,000 words of uh, fiction a day, which is probably writing books faster than most people can read them. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're a fantasy fan aficionado, um, you know that he kind of single-handedly rescued the horror writer H.P. Lovecraft from the obscurity of the pulp magazines that would have just ended up in bales at uh, paper mills waiting to be recycled if it hadn't been for for Duralith Publishing. Uh, Lovecraft in handsome hardcover editions. So that was one of the that was one of the writers that I wrote to. The other one, these are both Wisconsin connections. Uh, I was very much uh, I was very much playing the field at home. Uh, the other one was Robert Block, B L O C H. And uh, if you <clears throat> if you've seen uh, quote Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, you know some of the work of Robert Block because Robert Block wrote the book that Psycho was based on. So I, I was foolish and naive and clueless enough to just expect them to write back to me when I wrote to them and they did. And mm -hmm. uh, so I carried on a correspondence with both of these writers off and on for a couple of years, uh, you know, kind of well into, into high school. And uh, I never turned out to be the kind of writer that they were, but I credit them for giving me um, confidence by taking my wish to be a writer seriously. Uh, so at the age of 13 or 14, I had solidly established my identity as uh, a striving would-be writer. And uh, I don't think that would have happened if I hadn't had these uh, adult writers um, paying attention to me. Then in high school is when you started writing poetry. Um, yeah, more more or less. It was at that point. It's all 
you know, imitations of Edgar Allan Poe, you know, the bells, 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 and the rhyming and the chiming of the bells, uh, bells, 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 bells. Um, but, and then, but in college, you published a couple of poems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another, another interesting thing that happened to me in high school was a, a, a friend of mine moved out to Arizona and uh, his English teacher there had uh, shirt tail connections to the beats out in California. And I said, man, man, I'm really interested in that. Can you send me some beat books? And this guy did send me um, a little bundle of books, Ginsburg, Corso, Kerouac, Ferlinghetti. So that was the first modern poetry that I, I saw that excited me. So, you know, that, that influenced me gradually, but in high school, I was still pretty solidly, you know, kind of a Gothic poetry kid. Yeah, I can relate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then in college, you got, you, got, you got to run into some pretty cool poets at parties and stuff, especially after. Oh, after oh sure. You know, I mean, so here we are at, at this little um, Midwestern uh, ag school, basically, University of Wisconsin, River Falls. Um, which which fate had me ending up living about a block away from in that direction over there from where I sit. But when I was a student in the, um, mostly in the 60s and a little bit in the 70s, um, it was a good time uh, for catching great poets at bargain prices. <laughs> so, well, that's the only way I can put it. Um, I mean, our school got, um, they had a good concerts and lectures um, budget and they got, um, wow, you know, they got Ginsburg, they got Bly, they got Stafford, <clears throat> they got um, Galway Cannell, um, they got Gary Snyder. So these uh -huh. were poets that were just, you know, passing through this school and they were very accessible because it was a small school and there were only, you know, a few weirdos that were interested in, you know, poetry. So, you know, we had Post great, uh, we had great access uh, to these poets. Well, and, and um, you did one night, you did meet Robert Bly at a party and he gave you some words of advice that later yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah, really that's right. In your favor. Yeah, I, um, well, flash forward, I'm no longer a student. I'm just, I'm kind of knocking around, um, not knowing what to do with my life. Um, not quite sure how I fit into uh, American society, such as it is. And, uh, oh, I must have been in my mid, uh, mid 20s. And I was, you know, I was a post student hanging around, you know, the scene. Well, Bly uh, did a reading here and uh, I got invited to, you know, the faculty members party afterwards. So Bly is sitting on the floor, you know, with his glass of wine and he's surrounded by, you know, all the academics and they want to talk about, you know, the academic trends in poetry and blah, 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 blah. And he's clearly completely bored out of his skull <laughs> by that conversation. And I happened to be sitting next to him, and um, I must have, you know, represented a little more concentration of life than was in the rest of the room. He, he asked me just out of the blue, he said, uh, what's your sign? I said, well, I'm a Capricorn. He said, well, I'm a Capricorn, too. And I said, really? Wow. No, I mean, this is good news for me. <laughs> this is somebody, at least my astrological sign. And he started to tell me about how... Um, I shouldn't worry if I couldn't get it together yet at this point in my life, because he said Capricorns, you know, take a long time doing that. He said, you know, I didn't have, I didn't get married and I didn't have any kids until I was, you know, in my mid thirties. So, um, you know, I, I had some more, um, you know, roaming around in the world to do before I could settle down in any meaningful way. And uh, Bly's, uh, Bly's encouragement really essentially allowed me to get more gracefully through the rest of my 20s and finally you know at 30 I was you know, it was starting to uh it was starting to coalesce into something that you know was looking like maybe a life you went to um about 29 you went to Europe 
and yeah yeah had an experience yeah. that yeah. changed yeah. you and made yeah. poetry yeah. yeah yeah i turned i turned 30 in italy uh with uh with 14 young italians in uh in salerno italy we had a little party yeah mm -hmm. i uh i just um uh, I decided that I had to put myself through some kind of initiatory experience and I wasn't getting really getting anywhere where I was and I'd always wanted to go to Europe, but I had been a little bit afraid uh, of not, not being able to, you know, speak the languages, you know, uh, all, all that stupid stuff that you worry about when you haven't done it. So I, I saved up a thousand dollars. Uh, picking fruit out in Washington state and bought a one-way ticket uh, to Europe. Um, and then I just, um, I just bummed around for a whole year and picked up odd jobs, various places, um, wrote, had experiences, got exposed to culture. Um, I think the, the most important thing I learned in Europe was that year was that uh, in, in Europe, uh, artists are respected and people like me, uh, you know, who are trying to be poets or, or whatnot, could actually uh, at some point feel that they fit in uh, to society and they weren't completely, you know, completely worthless. Um, so that, um, that bolstered my self-esteem. Uh, and I came back uh, a year later and actually started writing some of the first, you know, more serious poems that that I wrote. Well, uh, they've some of them got into my first book, uh, but that wouldn't happen for oh, wow. Let's see. Well, that's when you met Krista too when you came back. And you yeah, landed it was back in nine, the river falls. Yeah, it was river 19 falls. it was 1978. You know, come back, came back summer of 78. And uh just to just to gauge the amount of time this took, my first book, Keeping the Star was published in 1988 so it was 10 years from you know starting point to kind of the first real milestone along the way well and then um you've emphasized the importance of teachers for you mm -hmm, and poetry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the what seems yeah. most um influential yeah. teacher you've mm -hmm. had is robert bly and below mm -hmm. you worked for him for over 30 years mm -hmm. so you right. learned so much from him Mm -hmm. Is there um, like something that stands out? It says stands out that you, <laughs> oh you know out of every, everything. I know it's a, a yeah, yeah. Well, maybe just a little background here. Um, so I I met I met Robert. Um, what year would that have been? I suppose that would have been. Uh, Oh, I should maybe 74, the scene that I was describing earlier. Yeah, okay. I'd actually gone to a reading with a, a bunch of students and one of my teachers in 1969 that Bly did for Poets Against the Vietnam War. And there was a big party there too uh, at a professor's house on the West River Road in Minneapolis. But us students were so intimidated you know, by the heavy guns poets that were there, including Bly, that the poets stayed in the kitchen and talked with each other. <laughs> and, and the hippie kids, including me, ended up sitting under the dining room table, um, singing, playing the guitar. So that's, <laughs> that doesn't count. So, seven, you know, five years later, you know, I finally meet Robert Bly yeah. after, after that first exposure. And, um, and I started, uh, I started really becoming aware of him and 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 following his readings around and uh, uh, you know I suppose I got to be a you know really familiar face along the way and um, in uh, in 1990 fall of 1990 when uh, uh, when his book Iron John became an international bestseller. He was suddenly getting so much mail that he really needed a regular uh, assistant, and um, I fortuitously had just had just quit a job that I'd been on for two days and was horrible. So I was suddenly available, and um, uh, I went to work for him in the fall of 
1990, and I actually still I actually still help his widow Ruth out. He died last year, uh, but yeah, it's a long uh, it's a long history. What did I learn? Oh Christ! Um, you know what didn't I, I learn? Two things you, what, you learned what, about poetry. <laughs> well, one one thing I learned was was to be bold and you know not let um, you know establishment types cow me <laughs> because I was definitely you know Bly came out of a farm family an immigrant farm family so he was not your typical. He was not your typical Harvard educated um, academic. You know, he still maintained um, a connection with his with his roots. And I came out of a working class uh, family in Northern Wisconsin. So I didn't have any of that pedigree either. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I think I, I, I learned from him that you didn't have to have that. You just had to have vision. And, um, and, and, and you didn't pay too much attention about you know who said you know who you know was the best and who was getting the prizes and who was getting the awards and who was getting the you know the plummy uh teaching positions none of that stuff mattered the important thing was to include your soul in everything that you write so i'd say that's maybe the most important thing i learned from Bly. and that's just that's beautiful well today you are the teacher you teach poetry classes at the Literary Loft in Minneapolis. How often do these go on and what advice mm -hmm. would you, you have for poets that are here today? Oh, and I, I, I recognize quite a few actually. So you know, this is, I don't know if they want to hear more advice from me or not. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I started teaching there about 20 years ago, uh, 20, 22 years ago. And, I don't I don't teach as frequently as I do now um, and because I really want more time for my own my own writing projects I'm kind of in a in a highly productive period that way uh, so I, I'm being a little more picky about about what I teach but I have you know three or four you know like six week classes that I that I really like doing that seem to be you know popular with other people and I don't know where's this going um, I guess I'll keep doing it for a while. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> what advice? What advice? I, geez, I don't know. Um, what kind of advice do you want? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got one question. Okay. That okay. Read me recently. Okay. Um, what is your opinion about capitalizing every the beginning of every line? Not necessary. <laughs> I don't do it. Yeah, you don't personally. <laughs> You, you know, it's, it. you know, it's a matter of choice. It, you know, stylistic uh, matters like that are, are completely optional. And uh, actually, one of the things I like about poetry is that there's a lot of a lot of room for smudge. So, I mean, even if you're, you know, like writing haiku, for instance, there's there's a few different ways to write haiku that are equally legitimate and um, there are forms in poetry that kind of blur and smudge into other forms and they're hard to pin down and I like that too because I think that choice um, gives us uh, a lot of room to move and you know like I'm saying you know be bold so you know make your own choices and just say to hell with everything else don't worry about what other people are saying about it well, I that, think it's time we talk books. Okay. And we hear some <laughs> Enough of that, right? Enough of it. Okay. Some books and poetry. Okay. We have published 11 poetry collections and yeah. seven chat books. In there, mm -hmm. it's got to be one that stands out as a favorite. Can we hear a poem from it? <laughs> no, I actually, actually, honestly, I don't have, I don't have any favorites. Um, the, you know, I guess my favorite one is the, the one that I'm working on now. So, oh, it always is. It always is because it's the, you know, it's kind of the moving edge of where you are, but. Are the um, one you just finished. Yeah, um, but I, I would, you know, you always, you, you always uh, 
you have a special attachment to your first child. Yes. Um, and this is um, and this is my first poetry child, Keeping Star, and this came out in 1988. Um, and I worked years and years on that. I write them a lot faster now, but you know when you're when you're when you're doing a first one, it's just so important and hard to get everything you know feeling right because you haven't done it before. You know, and you don't know how it should feel. You get a little little bit under your belt and then suddenly, oh yeah, that, you know, I remember how I did that. Or yeah, this, you know, this, this is how it should feel. But that one was the first one. And um, uh, did, did you say you wanted to hear a poem from it? Is yes. that right? Is that right? Okay. All right, I'm gonna give you the title poem and I'm gonna tell you the story behind it. Uh, do we have time to do that? I think so. Okay. Well, if we run yeah, out of time, we just run out of questions. So. Oh, we just just yeah. keep going. Yeah. So. Um, or is there no reason to stop? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. You know, the year is 1978, and uh, I'm back from, you know, being in Europe and uh, living here in River Falls, uh, and um, my love, Krista Spieler, and I have just moved in together. So this is something really new. And um, I had a friend up, I, you know, I still hadn't had anything published, you know, I'm just, but I'm writing like crazy now. And I have some sense of mission. Uh, I had a friend um, lived up uh, in a town farther north and she was an experienced, you know, poet and her husband was, you know, an experienced fiction writer. And I'd go up there and, you know, just hang out and soak some of it in from them. Her name was Melanie Richards. And, I'm not sure what she's doing right now, but she's a fabulous poet. Um, and I'd always come, you know, I'd come away from their place, you know, with an armload of borrowed books because they had, you know, they had the library that I wish I had. Um, and I, you know, I came back, you know, it was a spring morning in 1978 and I just felt filled with promise. Um, and I was tired from not sleeping that much, but I sat down at my desk and I scrawled off a poem just super fast. And uh, it felt like something, uh, it felt like something that I wasn't really technically capable of doing at that time. So to me, it was a total gift. And the way I interpreted it was, it was some kind of sign from the universe uh, telling me, you know, to to follow this path, you know, to keep going with it. You know, you know you're not gonna write this well every time, but you know, sooner or later you, you will. So this is the poem and it's the title poem of the book. It's called, <clears throat> called Keeping the Star. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Keep the star for when you lose the world, when grief and desire <clears throat> become a blurred door <clears throat> that floats away across a plain room without books or kisses. Look to what grows dark beyond the walls, that in night which holds the blue sky singing in its black embrace. It's all spun around a necessary star, star of prisons. Keep it. It has the power to burst from dull thoughts, breathe in airless colors, and roll back the filth of your neglect. Let it pour through <clears throat> the chimney hole patched with tin, unloved objects, <clears throat> empty jars, faces in clippings, balls of hair spurned by the brush. <clears throat> All the children of failure will step forward in its blinding wind, sons and daughters of that before which there is no trivial being. That is keeping the star. <clears throat> that is. Mm. That's the one came from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I'm <clears throat> like I'm bragging about this, but when I go back and look at the uh, at the original draft of it, I changed almost nothing. I mean, it was almost almost completely right, <clears throat> just the way it was. Well, and that's sometimes, I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes how they come out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, lightning strikes. Yeah, it goes boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, you're about ready to release a new book right now. Before, yeah. some months ago, you released one called Medicine Year. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us the premise of that and read us a couple of poems? Sure. Well, I'll just say, um, you know, one thing that happens after you've been writing for a long time is <clears throat> your work starts to kind of snowball. And, uh, you know, you put together a book and there are poems that get left out of it because they don't quite fit. Uh, so you have stuff left over and you keep writing and, you know, the file folders keep getting fatter and, you know, eventually, you know, you've created some body of work and you still haven't, you know, really uh, done justice to it all in terms of, of publication. So about, uh, hmm, let's see, let's say um, three years ago, I found myself working on about three different, or maybe four years ago, I found myself working on about three different books at the same time. Uh, a couple of them were poetry and they've both been published. Um, one of them was a prose book and the one you're talking about is, um, it's called Poetry on the Side of Nature. And this is, this is a brand new book. It's just out uh, this past month. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's actually um, uh, uh, an extended essay about the nature poet poem, excuse me, the nature poem uh, in defense of the environment. So it's kind of a more activist approach uh, to nature poetry. And I developed it out of my teaching at the loft and uh, some essays that I had written separately and kind of managed to put them together in some way that made sense so that's that's the book that's just coming out right now and i well, i think I'll later on i'll read a poem from it but <clears throat> the one that you've also referred to is this book called medicine year and uh, we're <clears throat> we're fortunate enough to have the cover artist john ilg with us right here in one of these little hollywood squares and he did this fabulous uh, cover painting for this. I just, it's, I mean, it's just extravagantly beautiful. And everybody that's seen it thinks so. Can you hold so, it back a little bit and up by your shoulder? What's that? Hold it up and back by your shoulder. A little, back a little bit more. There we go. Cool. Now we can see it. Okay. Yeah, right. That's nice. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is a, this book is kind of an extra book and <clears throat> the way it happened was uh, COVID, that's part of the way it happened. And then a couple of medical crises on the part of Krista and myself happening right around the same time with the result that um, she ended up in hospital and out of the house for three months total. I ended up getting prostate surgery um, we're both doing pretty good right now, but <clears throat> that, that, that period when that was happening was quickly succeeded by, <clears throat> by the onset of COVID and then the lockdown. So we managed to get, get Krista home, uh, about two weeks after her nursing facility was locked down and I could only, you know, communicate with her through, through the window <laughs> of her room walking around the side of the building so it was just in time <clears throat> so we had the rest of basically the rest of the year to uh shelter <clears throat> in place um w w which actually turned it into a good year i mean it, it sounds paradoxical but <clears throat> 2020 turned out to actually be a really good year and i wrote a ton of poems and i thought you know i might be writing a, a whole separate book this year and uh, I just kept an eye on that. I kept an eye on the quality and the trajectory of the work. And by the time I got into the fall, I said, yeah, this, this is a book. You know, I don't know if it's a good one, but it's a book. Uh, so, so I trusted my uh, instinct and I went with it. So that's, that's what this book is. It's all, it's a book of 2020 poems. we get to hear a poem or two? Sure, sure. And I, I wanna, I wanna, I'll, I'll read you a couple of them just to, um, 
I don't know, just to demonstrate the range or the breadth of the book. Uh, because the way I describe it, <clears throat> you know, in a nutshell, it sounds like it could be kind of a kind of a grim book, and it really it really isn't. There's there's a fair amount in it about our you know medical travails, but not not overwhelmingly. And uh, there's a lot of nature poetry in it. Um, there are a few political poems. Um, uh, there's really all kinds of poems in it. So I'd say that the 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 overall theme of this book is healing in a you know kind of a wider sense okay so <clears throat> i wanted wanted to pick two different kinds of poems uh, to read you um, <clears throat> i'm going to i'm going to read one that i've never read <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> it's the allergy <clears throat> um, i've never read this one allowed, but it seems like a, a good poem for kind of homing in on the kind of the more medical uh, side of this of this book. Um, it's called 44 Days, and it's in three parts. Um, we were lucky enough uh, for Chris to have, to have fantastic care after his stroke at United Hospital in St. Paul. I mean, it was just, it was fabulous. The people there were so kind and so, so good to her and to us. I actually, um, I actually felt sad uh, when it was time for her to leave because I was, I was living there. I was there like almost every day, you know, for 44 days. And uh, uh, it felt much more like home than, than our house did at that point, our house was. You know, I was alone. We didn't have any cats at that point, and um, it was the dark of winter. Um, it it was it it was it was a sad place, uh, as opposed to the hospital. The hospital was full of life and um, and, and friendliness. So, I, I wrote <clears throat> I wrote a poem to try to capture some of that feeling. <clears throat> okay. 44 days and it's in three parts i won't i won't give you the numbers i'll just pause a little bit in between <clears throat> after 42 of krista's 44 days at united a nursing assistant named dave tells me sometimes the next day a person is gone and we're the last ones to have performed some kind act for them i've worked here seven years and that's happened to me a few times. It feels important. Dave smiles. And this is Dave speaking again. The best thing is when we see someone leave recovered and strong again. Wow. When Krista had been a week in hospital for her stroke, attempts were being made unsuccessfully to get her walking. A nurse named Tara told how she'd observed my wife leaning to one side on the bed and drooling and told the doctors, this woman isn't ready. Thus, her advocacy for Krista kept her in intensive care at a critical moment. Gratitude to Tara. During Krista's six weeks at United, I have practically lived there myself, witnessed the stops and starts, the gains and setbacks, and overarching it all every day, a dedication to caring that humbles me. No one would choose to be in the hospital, yet I'm certain there are few places on this earth where one can get as close to heaven. That's 44 days. Wow. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yep, and I mean it. Hmm. So uh, for <clears throat> another side of this book, um, it's very seasonal. It, matter of fact, it's completely chronological. That was one of my rules. <clears throat> there was no 
there was no shuffling of dates. The poems had to appear in the order in which they were written and they're dated. So you can, you can tell when they were written. I was looking at the calendar today and thinking I'd like to get something as close, if not on today, written two years ago as I can. Well, <clears throat> this was written a year ago or two years ago yesterday, uh, September 6th. And it's, uh, it's a nature poem, it's called Orb Weaver. There it was, deep in the Kinnikinnick woods, hovering like a smoke ring, where young maple and young elm contended for space, so that it was impossible to tell just where it was anchored, where mottled morning sun struck through to light it. At first, I absurdly thought someone had strung a CD in the trees, so round and prismatic it appeared in its suspension, or more absurdly, a hologram of a CD, flimsy, shimmering, yet dimensional, as the sun above and behind fired red and gold tones into its close concentric grooves. At last, recognizing it for what it was, I could make out the bright bead of the orb weaver's body working in meticulous circles inward toward the empty center that perfectly round nothing, so accommodating and yielding to the fine intensity of her plan, her craft, orb weaver spider. Who's, who's seen an orb weaver web? You know, yeah, a couple of people, yeah. I mean, it's it's like this, it's like perfectly round. It's just perfectly round. It's just somewhere up there in the air. And it's, maybe it's an angel's CD. You know, they can, they can hear the music on it, we can't. So those are a couple of, those are a couple of poems from the book. Oh, I can't hear you. Can't hear you, River. You're muted, I think. Uh-oh. That's a problem, isn't it? Nobody's got <laughs> um, I was going to say, that is the book to everybody that we're doing using for the giveaway. So yes. um, all of you that don't know about our giveaway is it's, you have one guess, the one through 50. You can put it in the chat. Whoever closest, well, we have two numbers out. So whoever's closest to the number and does before going over wins and it'll be announced at the end. So okay. here you go, everybody. I don't know how many are in there right now. Um, so I've always believed that people get so much more out of hearing a poem from the poet <clears throat> when they read it. And you taught me about something called <clears throat> at a poet's tune. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that means? Well, that's a that's a term I got from the poet Donald Hall, and um, you know, Hall was a you know a wonderful poet, but maybe even better, uh, even better. Uh, 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 what do I want to say? Uh, an explicator of poetry. Um, he he was a he was a fantastic teacher, and in one of his essay. He writes about um, quote catching uh, a poet's tune, and basically that's the ability to hear their voice in your head um, when you're when you're reading them on the page. Um, but you usually can't do that unless you've heard them read their poetry, you know, yeah. in person live. You can. Once, once you learn how they sound, you can internalize that and hear them uh, when you're reading their poems. And that's, that's, what, that's what Hall meant by, you know, yeah. catching a poet's tune. So, oh, yeah, I couldn't read, uh, you know, I couldn't read so-and-so until I heard, heard her read. Uh, and, and now I caught her tune. So, you know, now I, now I know what her poetry sounds like. And that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's useful. It's yeah, a, it's a not everybody concept. will be able to do it because they yeah. gotta be able to catch the tune. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm 
curious what inspires you to write poetry or do you a poet that sits down to write every day or do you at a certain time or do poems just come to you out of the blue? Um, not quite either one actually, but um, I think poets need to have some life outside of poetry. So other interests, you know, feed, feed your writing. If you, if you're just doing nothing but writing all the time without any input or inspiration out of the real world, I think you can get, you can get kind of uh, ingrown and, and, and solitary. What, what makes me write? I mean, that's another question. Um, uh, I think I, I, I think I discovered at a certain point that it was a you know just it was a pathway through life you know life isn't easy to navigate necessarily especially for a, a young person when you try a lot of different things you go down a lot of uh, blind alleys and, and cul-de-sacs dead ends uh, and if but if you're lucky you find you find something to do in your life that is meaningful that is beautiful that is a vehicle for you know for development and growth and uh that's that's what poetry is for me that's cool well mm -hmm. i would mm -hmm. summer of 69 we're gonna go back summer of 69 <laughs> summer of 69 you and six others uh, packed the yeah. van up and headed East to Woodstock. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Can we hear a story about Woodstock? And I would love to hear the one about the Who. Well, i I think I think I'll let let a poem tell the story. Um, oh, and and then vis a vis her comment about the Who. Um, all of the the people that I went to Woodstock with, we uh we get together for reunions every few years and. Uh, and we invariably have uh, discussions of, you know, who, you know, who, who was the best, who was the best act you saw mm. at Woodstock. And there's at least a couple of us that say, oh, it was definitely, absolutely the who, you know, who were, came on stage, I don't know, at some ungodly hour, like, you know, three or four in the morning. And they were, they were right pissed because they were supposed to go on at 11 and they'd been, they'd been stalled, stalled, and stalled. So um, they put in a furious performance. You can see some of it, um, some of it on YouTube. And I think someone's in the uh, Woodstock movie, uh, but it, it was just fantastic. It was like every, it was like every stroke of uh, Pete Townsend's guitar kind of raised the Kundalini up the back of your spine. And it, top of your head it was just fantastic so that's i'm 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 a who is the best best one uh proponent okay so this is this is a poem it's called okay. it's Dot, and it tells the story i hope um it's dedicated to my traveling companions leo Linny, david carol and mike so we're all alive this is a good thing um yes. woodstock that August morning, 40 years ago in Wisconsin, we six mismatches, refugees and orphans piled into Linny's Chevy Nova with no food, no change of clothes, almost no money, though lots of reckless, desperate, spontaneous youth, and drove all night to upstate New York where we calmed and trafficked to Yasker's farm. We joined a seven mile foot caravan Passed joints, drank jug wine, laced with only God knows what, got separated, rained on, didn't find each other until it was all over. For three days, we lived hand to mouth on whatever came to us, got lost, got found, befriended others who were lost. The first night, I shared a tarp with some Philly hippies, the second, an army surplus tent with a girl from New Hampshire commune her feet dirtier than mine. Our movie stood in awe of its own soundtrack. Janis Joplin, Sly and the Family Stone, The Who, fringed Daltrey twirling his mic like some golden god of the dawning Woodstock nation. When on Monday, Hendrix, Hendrix blasted his scorched reveille, we found ourselves still standing 
victors in some improbable battle, though it might have ended differently had a particular Pennsylvania state trooper known two kids in the car were underage. Parenthesis, one whiff of our gear and he hastened us on without searching the trunk where our stash lay swaddled in debris of the pilgrimage. <laughs> Straggling back to tell the tale to small town friends, our nerve endings, it may be, set permanently tingling. We split up again and this time didn't regroup for decades. Though when we did, we understood that each had in his or her own way smuggled back home a tiny piece of the garden. Now I think, what a crazy, lucky, right thing it was for us to do. We didn't keep our adventure waiting. We didn't worry how we'd get home. We just jumped in that Chevy Nova and drove. Mm -hmm. That time will never come again. Though for us, it will last as long as we need it to. The rest of our lives. Bravo. Woodstock. <laughs> well, now you know that happens to be the end of my poems for now. So we would love if you did a five minute. You ready to read some more? Oh, okay. Uh, is, are you, uh, I'm, I have to just, you know, figure this out for myself. Are you, are you going to have other people ask questions if they want to? Is that uh, part of this? Or? Or yeah, no. if there's if we yeah, have time yeah. at the end, but I don't think we have time. Oh, okay. Are, are we cutting out right at eight? Okay. Well, we All can right. go over a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. Do you have somebody you know. that you want to ask you a question? Because Julie, we could. I don't know. Um, well, here. Okay. I've got a, a couple of poems that I'd like to read. This is a this is another a new one that I haven't read before, and I I kind of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nepotistically put it in my own um, in my own book here so um, it's called this morning I saw two foxes I haven't read this before um, you know what what's a tightrope artist uh, uh, who has to use a net so you know that's we're gonna, we're gonna see we're gonna see how this goes this morning I saw two foxes 5 30 no one else on the path Sunrise through the trees, reflecting gold on the still river. I'd heard about the family living in a hillside den near the auto body shop. Light, but the quality still hazy with a bit of duskiness. Where I'd hoped to see them, there they were in a little clearing under the hill. Two lean red beings, no doubt aware of me before I was aware of them. Well, we know what had to happen then. Such glimpses are a fleeting treasure. Off ran the first, the larger one, her tail floating behind her, almost gravityless, and then the smaller one, though more slowly, the two of us locking eyes for what seemed an unbreakably long moment. They fled across a gravel road toward woods but didn't vanish, rather watched with what looked to me like curiosity at the end of a red fence, red fence, red fur, until I was out of sight around a bend in the path. I was the signal that their time of free roaming was over. I who walked on into the morning elated that I could now count myself among the company of those who had seen the foxes. So that's just a little, little River Falls story. Woohoo, that, um, that was good. I think it, it, you brought it to the right people. I good, really good, good. I, I, I didn't fall off the wire apparently. Um, let's see, how about one more? Um, yeah, you can read a couple more. Couple more, okay. Um, this is another poem from, uh, from medicine year. <clears throat> uh, toward the end of the year, I, um, I I had the definite feeling that I was starting to wind up, you know, what was going to become the book. Uh, so in certain ways, um, 
the poems got kind of more, um, a little more summing up. Um, poets tune is playing. Um, so, um, a cryptic utterance there from Salt Lake City. Um, so, um, I've been writing Christmas poems for a long time now. Um, Christmas is, I think Halloween used to be my favorite holiday. Now Christmas has become my favorite holiday. I don't know why. But um, um, I hadn't ever written about the division of the weeks preceding Christmas into the four Sundays and the four weeks of Advent. So I'd been studying that a little bit and thinking about it. And I thought, okay, you know, like every... Every week we, we start lighting a new candle for Advent and they all have themes, you know, peace, love, hope, joy. And, well, why not do poems uh, too? So I started to write a series of Advent poems that are interspersed with the, um, with the other poems. And this, this one is from December 8th and it's called Advent Candle Peace. Okay, this is a sec actually sec beginning the second week of Advent. And this, this, this is a longer poem. It's got a lot in it. Peace to the goose with the broken wing, eliciting the maddening kindness of human beings, maddening because inconsistently applied. Peace to the snapping turtle, burrowed in the river bottom mud, frozen and sealed as if for judgment day. Peace to the queen bee in her hive, kept warm at the center of a ball <clears throat> made of thousands of her subjects, not all of whom will survive the winter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peace to the bear in her leafy den, giving birth in her sleep, as it seems that poets sometimes do, astonished to awaken to the bright hungry eyes of the poem. Peace to the trees, keeping their minds on heaven while holding fast the under sky of roots and mycelia. Peace to the clouds, shielding the sun from the glaring follies of humans below. Peace to all the fevered world with its rising tempers and tides. Peace to the famished who have eaten the poisoned bread of lies. Peace to the strangers to themselves, unable to abide their own company. Peace to those from whom everything has been stripped, who shiver in fear of the coming winter, having never recovered from the last. Peace to those who live in dread of the picture the puzzle pieces of dusk are assembling. Peace to those whom anger and shame keep awake through the long night fighting the reckoning that collapses the day. Peace to the one who lights a single candle, hoping its heat is enough to keep him alive while help is on its way. Peace to those who wait patiently and impatiently for a new song to be born in the silence. Not in there. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> just tell you about one <clears throat> one of those lines <clears throat> in my rambling days i got <clears throat> a long hitchhike ride with a professional traveling salesman he got he told me a story about getting stuck in a blizzard <clears throat> up by fargo one year <clears throat> and the blizzard was so thick that when the plow came through it plowed him in and didn't even see him so he was stuck in his car, you know, buried in the blizzard snows for you know, something like 24 hours before, you know, the storm ended and they finally found him. <clears throat> and he said he learned at that time <clears throat> that you can stay alive in cold like that with a single, a single match or candle flame in a car. He had a bunch of paperbacks that he was carrying around with him. <clears throat> and he just got out his uh, glove compartment no, not his, I mean his ashtray, I'm sorry. He pulled out his ashtray, <clears throat> put it on the seat, and page by page burned these, um, 
uh, paperback pages until, until after he'd run out of, uh, out of gas. So that will keep you alive. One candle flame in a cold car caught in a blizzard. I think everybody around here should know that. <clears throat> no, probably also being it surrounded by snow like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably save them too. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's funny. Well, let's do a quick little, <laughs> let's see who won the giveaway and then we'll come back and read okay. some more poems. <clears throat> okay. Julie, who won? Um, so Kate and Mark uh, guessed right on the dot, number 49. Oh, wait, 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 wait. That's your <clears throat> friends from. <clears throat> that's, that wasn't the number I picked. No, that's my number. Oh, that's your number. Oh, oh, I, oh I see we both <laughs> get one, huh? Okay. And then two numbers. Okay. Lauren, um, and <clears throat> guess 17. Okay. That was my number. Yeah. Yeah, right on the head. So there we go. <clears throat> okay. One of them's going to your good friend your friends from Salt Lake, I mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll just have to double up then. Yeah. How do um, how do I get how do I get a book to Lauren? Well, Lauren, why don't you put your address <clears throat> in the chat and directly <clears throat> send it is the person here? <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Can somebody win if they're not here? No. Lauren, here. What? Here's Lauren. Right over there. Yep. Oh. See her? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Then <clears throat> address in the chat and you'll get the book. Okay. Okay. Now right. can we hear a couple more poems? What's that now? We hear it's like two more poems. We're two more. Okay. We're All going right. over time. But I <clears throat> okay. I can do that. Um, before gonna... Read another poem. Lina Ballard forwarded a message to me that you are doing a reading in St. Paul, and I thought you might like to announce that. Because oh yes, thank you. The people here. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. To your reading. Yeah, actually, it's a week from tonight. It's at um, Unity uh, Unitarian, um, and uh, it's that's in St. Paul. It's going to be both live and uh, uh, live streamed, and it's going to feature this book. It's a reading from uh, Medicine Year. So um, uh, let's see, how can I, uh, how can I <clears throat> get info here? Um, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to put my, um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat right now. And if you want info on this reading, just email me and I'll, I'll send it out to you. Um, let's see here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Everyone, where are you? Everyone, here we are. Okay. Okay. Whoops. And this is sad is I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to Facebook, everybody, and we'll to so but we keep going, you keep going. Okay. Um I'm just going to, uh, <clears throat> I think I'll just pick a couple more poems out of, um, out of Medicine Year. What? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, this, is a, this is a poem called Back Fence Jam. And um, Krista says, yeah, good one. <clears throat> one of the ways that year that we kind of stayed sane was um, we go out in the backyard and um, our neighbor friend, uh, Colin Cosgrove, who's